It is good to be back in the house today. I thank God that He's given us this time to come and spend together. I'm thankful for the blessings and the mercies He's supplied. He's been better to us than we ever deserved. And I know tonight that every good thing has come from Him. Open your Bibles, if you will. Hebrews chapter number 12. Hebrews chapter number 12. Let me say again. God's been good. He's been better to me than I could ever be to Him. There's no way I could ever repay what He has done for me. And I think if y'all were honest, you'd say the same thing. Thankful for His love and His grace. I'm going to be honest with you tonight. This passage of Scripture, I have no idea how many times that I've used it. But this was one of those times that it didn't matter. I didn't look back and see how I had tried to preach it before. I didn't look back and see how many times I'd used it. Didn't matter. This is one of those that was on me, and I'm going to be honest with you. Last night, sitting at my desk, I couldn't help. The tears began to flow. This evening, we come home and we eat. Went in there and I sat down for a few minutes and they started again. If you're able to stand tonight in respect to the Word of God, I'm going to read two verses of Scripture. And that's verse 1 and verse 2 of Hebrews chapter 12. Now the first word in that first verse says for four, and it's pointing back to chapter 11. It's saying because of what we read in chapter 11, we need to pay attention. I'll be honest with you, I want more attention probably on, on, chapter, on verse 1 than I am. But I'm going to read verse 1 and verse 2 because it's all one sentence. The Bible says for four, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witness. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Thank you. You can be seated. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we come to you again this evening, Lord, we thank you for the day. We thank you for the way that you took care of us and watched over us. We thank you, Lord, for every need being supplied, for health and strength, for safekeeping from harm and danger. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege we have to be back in your house this evening. And I thank you for each one of these that's come out. I thank you, Lord, that we've got this time to come and worship and fellowship one with another. Father, thank you more than anything for salvation. I thank you for Jesus and the finished work at Calvary. I'm thankful tonight, God, that He did it all. He left nothing behind, left nothing undone. He, he, he finished it. And it's forever settled. There's never another drop of blood that has to be shed for sin. And God, I beg you tonight to forgive me where I failed you. Forgive me where I've come short. Forgive me for the things I've said, done, and thought that was displeasing. Father, I thank you for the song that was sung. I thank you, Lord, for each testimony. But God, I need your help now for the next few minutes. I beg you for that touch, that fresh anointing from on high. I need you, God, just to reach down. Give me the words to say and show me what you'd have me to do. God, I'm not here to put on a show, not here to entertain, not here to impress. Just here tonight, God, to try to preach a word that will help you people, to encourage you people, and help lift them up. You watch my mouth, don't you let me say it wrong. Don't you let me lead anybody astray. Just go with us now through the remainder of this service and have your way. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Wherefore, we are compassed about by so great a cloud of witness. When we look back in chapter number 11, I have heard preachers all my life refer to that as the Faith Hall of Fame. 
Those were the ones that walked. That Old Testament saints that walked the closest with God, looked to Him, believed in Him, had faith in Him, called on Him, and the Bible says that they all died, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. But they died in faith. And it says, Wherefore, because of all them, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, I'm not going to argue this and not debate it. I've had people tell me that when our loved ones die and go on, they're watching over us. I, I hope they're not. Because when I, when I die, I don't want to look over and see what's going on in this world. Right. I've had people say, well, that's what that means. Well, if that's what you believe, I, I'm not going to argue with you. I just, I, it wouldn't be heaven to me if I saw the things that were going on in this world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it says, wherefore we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Understand what that word witnesses means. Witnesses are those that have seen something and have experienced something that they can testify to. Mm -hmm. Witnesses are something that somebody can say, hey, this happened to me. This is not hearsay. This is not something I read about. This is something that happened to me. And thank God, you might doubt it, but you can't take it away from me. Mm -hmm. Wherefore, we're compassed about. That word compassed means more than just being surrounded by. That word means that we are bound to. We are tied to. We are connected to. And those people in chapter number 11, the writer of the book of Hebrews says, we are tied to them. We are connected to them. And he says, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now let me tell you something tonight. Your Christian walk, your Christian life, your Christian race is not a sprint. It is actually not a marathon. When Paul's talking about wherefore, because of them, let us run the race. It's almost like a relay. And he's telling us, they, they've run the race. And it starts out with, with Abel and comes right on down the line. And it gets to the point that he, there's some names he don't even mention. He begins to talk about them and they. And there's a lot of them and they's that we don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in the world we're living in today, there's a lot of them and they's that people may not know about. Right. But we're all tied together. We're all bound together to run the race. Now you hear me, what I'm about to say. My family here tonight, there's three generations. Mm -hmm. When I leave it, if the Lord don't come back, if I leave this world before the Lord comes back, I want to be able to pass something along mm -hmm. to my son. I want to be able to pass the torch to him, pass the baton to him, and say, son, I'm leaving, but it's up to you. Carry it on. And if the Lord still don't come back before him and Miss Debbie Joe dies, I want them to pass it along to Olivia and Jay and say, here, listen, listen to me. We've we, we got it going here. We've tried to teach you. We've tried to bring you up. We've tried to raise you up. Now it's time for you to take the torch. It's time for you to take the baton. It's time for you to come on now and run your leg of the race. Yeah. My wife had this rebound for me a few years ago. And I don't carry it a whole lot. But I've got some names in here. And let me tell you something. When I get some of these, bear with me. You'll see where I'm going. Yeah. When I get preachers to sign my Bible, I don't look at preachers like they're rock stars. Yeah. Matter of fact, I was at Gospel Light at the last sword conference and there were some youngins came up to Brother Matt Morrison and them youngins was standing there and I said, listen to me. Let me give y'all a piece of advice. Brother Matt said, I'm listening. I said, I ain't talking to you, preacher. I'm talking to these. I said, youngins, let me tell you what you need to do. 
Before you go to bed tonight, these preachers that you've got to sign your Bible, I said, you need to open them up. You need to lay your hands on here. And when you're saying your prayers at night, you need to pray for the men that you had sign your Bible. This is not just an autograph session. There's a reason for this. Let me tell you something. There might come a time in my life that I don't remember what some of these men look like. I might not remember what they sound like. But I'm going to tell you something. I can look, be able to look back at this and I'll say, you know, there was a day that I got to meet Brother Matt Morrison, Brother Frank Shoemaker, Brother Alan Barker, Dr. Billy Martin. I could go on down the line. Darrell Hayes, Mike Norris, R.B. Ouellette, Tony Hudson. But then I think about those and I guess what really hit me with this scripture was when I found out yesterday that brother John Moxley went home to be with the Lord Sunday. Yeah. And I look at some of those names that I'm not going to see again until we get to the other side. Yeah. Just in the last, and even if you want to look at the last few years, some of them just, just the last few months. Brother Rayton Puckett, Brother Clyde Box, Raymond Barber, Brother Noah Fry, Brother Don Ball, Brother Bobby Robertson, Brother John Moxley, those were men that I had the privilege to sit in a pew while they were preaching the gospel. Yeah. Hear them challenge me. We're going to leave. But you've got a responsibility to take it after we're gone. You've got a responsibility to carry the baton on to the end and get your leg of the race done. Yeah. Some of these that I didn't get a chance to, to meet but that, I'll, that, but that I've been able to listen to, like that, that's gone on just in the last little bit. Brother Sandy Allen, Brother Stephen Ballou, Charles Worley, T.D. Burgess, Brother Jimmy Dillon died a few years ago, and I, I love Brother Jimmy yeah. down at Shining Light in Greensboro. Yeah. Oh, Brother Jimmy's like me. He can cut up, but when I'm telling you something, when he started to preach, you better pay attention. Yeah. And it was men like that that thank God, even if I didn't have chapter 11 in the book of Hebrews, I'd say, wherefore, we are compassed about by so great a cloud of witness. Let us run with patience the race that's set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Let me tell you something tonight. You and I have got a responsibility. And I'm telling you, I, this may even tie in with what I said Sunday night. If it does, that's fine. We need to be straight in what we believe. We need to be straight in what we're teaching. We need to be straight in what we're passing the next generation. There shouldn't be any confusion. And we should never doubt the things we've learned, the things we've been taught, and who taught them to us. Right. So let me just let me give you just a couple of things here and, and we'll quit and we'll go home. He says, Wherefore, seeing we're compassed about. With so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily. If there's anything that's weighing you down, get rid of it. Mm -hmm. If there's anything holding you back from following God the way you ought to, get rid of it. If there's anything that's holding you back that might be a stumbling block to somebody else, get rid of it. But you and I tonight, we've got a responsibility. And I'm going to give you three things First one is do not ever, don't cast that baton aside. Don't cast that mantle aside. Now hear what I'm telling you. In 1 Kings chapter number 19, Elijah had already told God, it's better for me to just die. I'm ready. I'm done. Ain't nobody left but me. And God gave him this list. This is the things you're going to do. This is the places you need to go. This is the things that's going to happen. Oh, and by the way, i got 7,000 reserved unto myself that's not bowed the knee to Baal nor kissed his image. Right. And in 1 Kings chapter 19, the Bible says that he departed and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. Yeah. And as he passed by, he cast his mantle on him and he just kept walking. Elijah didn't throw it away. Right. Elijah knew it's time for me to go and I want to make sure that there is somebody coming up behind me that thank God they're going to follow in these steps. 
They're going to preach the word of God. They're going to be the prophet of God. They're going to do like they ought to do and live like they ought to live. And instead of throwing it away and saying, I'm done, he put it on Elisha and kept walking. Elisha says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me go tell my parents. My... He said, hey, what you do is up to you. Let me tell you, it's up to us to get it. It's up to us to pass it. It's up to us to not throw it aside, mm -hmm. but to put it on somebody else. What they do with it then is entirely up to them. Amen. I can't control. Listen to me. I know preachers tonight that their family ain't nowhere around church. Mm -hmm. I know preachers tonight that have stood faithful and nowhere around church. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, their, their, their children, their grandchildren, they're gone. Don't want anything to do with church. And you don't have to look far to see that. Right. But I can't control what the next generation does. My job is to give it and put it on them and say, now you go with God and do what God wants you to do. Right. And that mantle, you need to understand, that mantle was more than just a robe. That mantle was more than just a covering. That mantle was a garment that, that symbolized the glory of God and the power of God that was on Elijah. Because you remember what Elisha did? What was his first miracle? After Elijah was carried up into heaven in that chariot of fire and that whirlwind, Elisha takes that mantle, walks over to the Jordan River and says, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And the Bible says he slapped the water with that mantle. And that mantle, shoo, the water parted. Yeah. Let me tell you something. We don't need to give them emotionalism. We don't need to give them sensationalism. We don't give them just carnal fleshly acts. We need to pass on. Not just for, we need to show this next year exactly what the power of God is able to do. Amen. I ain't talking about putting on a show. Right. Not talking about feelings. But that garment represented and symbolized the power and the glory of God that Elijah had. And remember what Elisha prayed for? He said, I want a double portion of what you've got. Mm -hmm. Elijah told him, he said, if you're with me when I'm taken up, you'll get it. You couldn't have pried him away with a crowbar. Mm -hmm. He stuck with Elijah every step of the way. He went from Gilgal to Jericho to Jordan and as one more. And I am just went blank. But that's all right. He would not leave his side. And he passed it to the next generation. The Apostle Paul, he wanted to do the same thing both with Timothy and with Titus. He told Timothy, in 2 Timothy, he said, Endure hardness as a good soldier. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Not approved to anybody else. Mm -hmm. Now that right there preached for three hours. See, folks, let me tell you something tonight. If we've got God's approval, that's all that's necessary. Amen. He told him, in your hardness, continue in the things that you've learned and preach the word. He told Titus, speak the things of sound doctrine. He tried to pass it along to them just like he passed it on. And Paul was in prison and Paul did not quit. He didn't throw it aside and say, I'm done. When Felix or Festus looked at him and said, Paul, you're beside yourself. Much learning doth make thee mad. He said, I ain't mad. He said, I ain't lost my mind. I know exactly what I'm doing. I know exactly what I'm saying. I know exactly what I'm preaching. And King Agrippa knows what I'm preaching. And he knows it's true. And that's why Agrippa said, Paul, almost, almost, thou hast persuaded me to be a Christian. You say, preacher, do people give it up? 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul tells Timothy, he says, Demas has forsaken me, mm -hmm. having loved this present world. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, folks, I ain't talking about people that goes from one church to another. I'm talking about people that leave church and don't go back. Amen. And they cast it aside. Miss, and I'm going to use her for an example. Miss Pauline, 
every Wednesday night. She'll say, pray for my children. Pray for my grandchildren. Pray for my children. They'll get back in church. Now let me tell you something right now. She's here Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. And I know the rest of you are too, but listen to me. She'd be a sorry example to set for her to hear me out. For her to pray. Pray for my children to get back in church. Pray for my grandchildren to get back. She'd be a sorry example if she wasn't here herself. Amen. And Demas told his children, told his grandchildren, and told everybody around him, serving God ain't worth it. I don't want the mantle. I don't want the glory. I don't want the power of God. I'm going to cast it aside. I'm not casting it to the next generation. I'm throwing it away. Yep. And that's where we're at right now. Yeah. <coughs> There's a lot of people who are saying, I'm done. Okay. Let me move. Don't cast the mantle away. Okay? Don't compromise the Word. One of the worst things that's happened in my life that I can see is preachers are beginning to compromise what's in the Bible. And I'm talking to pulpit. You've heard me say it before. You've heard me say it more times. You've got fingers and toes. That the biggest problem is right here in pulpit. Yeah. Now I don't have a right to compromise. I don't have a right to change it. I don't have a right to pervert it. Because Psalm 119 verse 89 is still in the book. Mm -hmm. Forever. Yeah. Forever. You could say eternally. It'd mean the same thing. Forever, O oh Lord. Thy word. Not Wayne's word. Mm -hmm. Thy word is settled in heaven. Right. And when people have told me that, and I've, I've you know, they've come to me and, and they've asked me my opinion. They've come to my wife and they've asked me. Her, what she thought. Well, so let's see what the Word says. Well, you know, preacher such and such said, and I said, preacher such and such ain't got a right to change what the Word of God says. Yeah, yeah but my husband, I don't care what your husband said. Well, my wife, I don't care what your wife said. Quit being him pecked and be the man of the house and do what you're supposed to do with the Word of God. <laughs> okay. I mean, if, it, if it's sin, it's sin. Right, yeah. You can't make it right. You can't change it. We've got enough perversion already. And because perverted word leads to a perverted lifestyle, people are going to wake up in hell one of these days scratching their head trying to figure out how they got there. Right. Well, this preacher said everything was all right. I had somebody years ago come to me and say, Preacher, I don't think I'm saved, but I remember a couple of years ago, there was a preacher. I bowed at the altar, and he prayed and laid hands on me, and he told me I was saved. I said, My prayers won't save you. His prayers won't save you. Until you ask Jesus into your heart, until you repent of your sins, and you ask Him to save you, you're going to hell. But he told me, I said, he lied to you. Mm -hmm. He compromised the word of God to make a young man feel good. Yeah. And that's what happens now. And we can talk all we want to about Revelation chapter 22. And I've had people tell me that that's it just, it, it's just referring to the book of the Revelation. Well, you say what you want to. But it says, if any man adds to the words of this book, he said, I'll add to him the plagues that are written therein. And if any man removes or takes out the words out of this book, he said, I'll take out his part of the book of life. You say, that's just, that's just the book of the Revelation. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 4. Moses made the statement, You shall not add unto the word that I command you, neither should you diminish aught from it. And so Moses in Deuteronomy, Jesus in Revelation says don't monkey with the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Several years ago, and I think it was the New American Standard. It might have been NIV, but I think it was the New American Standard. Robert Lodgson, right before he died, he made the statement, I am in trouble with the Lord. Mm -hmm. 
He said, I should have never been a part of that. I should have never been a part of it. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. I, I, st I will still stick with what I said Sunday night. I, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I'm also not ashamed of being an independent fundamentalist Baptist. And as long as I've got a King James Bible and that red back church in, I'll, I'll make it just fine. Don't compromise when it comes to the Word of God for the time will come. When they're not in your sound doctrine, but after their own lusts. Mm -hmm. Talking to a preacher today, and he's talking about somebody that he had, he had met. They talked to him. They said, Well, preacher, we're looking for a church. He said, Well, you, you're welcome to come over here. He said, They said, I'm looking for a church where I don't have to worry about hearing about hell or hearing about God's judgment. And he said, Well, keep looking. You'll find one. Yeah. <laughs> he said, You ain't going to find it here. But you'll find one. Because yeah. after their own lusts, yeah. they'll heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and they'll turn away from the truth and turn unto fables. Yeah. The Word gets compromised and when that gets compromised, lives get compromised and eternal salvation is compromised. Folks, let me tell you something. I, I truly do want to make my call and election show. Mm -hmm. And if the Bible I have is good enough for me to get saved out of, it's good enough for me to live by, and it's sure enough good enough for me to preach out of. Right. So because we are in this race, and the generation before us has passed the baton to us, and we need to pass it on to the next generation, don't throw that mantle away. Pass it to the next generation. Don't compromise on the Word of God let me give you this and I'll quit. Don't even consider defeat. If you ain't never heard it, if you've got a computer or you've got a phone that you can get in on YouTube, you go home tonight and you pull up Brother Curtis Hudson singing the song, I'm on the winning side. Now I'm, I love it when the choir sings it. But when you see that man that's frail, right. dying, knowing that he ain't got long. But thank God he ain't quit, he ain't foundered, he has keep on going, and he kept faithful till the day God called him home. Right. I'm on the winning side. And when a man dying of cancer can even let loose with a shout while he's singing it. You want your crank turned? Go home tonight and listen to that before you go to bed. Amen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm going to tell you, don't even consider defeat. Look, we can go back, and I'm almost done. We can go back. And we read in Mark chapter 14 where Simon Peter, look, he not only denied Jesus, but he did begin to curse. Look, Simon Peter, let's give him some, you know, give him some benefit. I, I don't know how many of us would have done different. There Jesus is. He's been arrested. As far as we know, it's over and done. They've taken him in there. He's going to be crucified. It's done. No, it wasn't done. It, it was just beginning. Thank God just getting started. Going to the cross to shed that blood to cleanse us from our sins. But thank God three days later coming out of that tomb victorious over death, hell, and the grave. Right. No, but Peter said, I'm done. He's done, so I must be. But what happened 53 days later? He stood with a boldness of the Holy Ghost and preached and 3,000 people got saved. Mm -hmm. Peter realized, hey, this thing ain't over. Thank God we're just getting cranked. Let's go with it. Just a couple days later, when that man that couldn't walk, he preached again and 5,000 got saved. Don't ever consider defeat. Thank God we have won this thing. It's already been decided. Sure, we're still having battles, but the war has already been decided. In 1 Kings chapter 19, we mentioned Elijah a few minutes ago. Before he went to Elisha, he was hiding in that cave. Then he was hiding under a juniper tree. And God said, what are you doing? 
I was jealous for your sake. No, he wasn't. He was scared. He was ready to quit. He had just prayed 53 words. The fire of God fell. Not only consumed the sacrifice, it consumed the altar. It consumed every drop of water. And it licked up the dust that was around the altar. The fire of God cleaned it all up. He said, don't let them escape. And there was 400 prophets of Baal, 450 prophets of the groves. He said, slay every one of them. Don't you let them escape. And at that point, they had enough courage to go on and do what needed to be done. But what happened? Word came from old Jezebel mm -hmm. and said, it's time tomorrow your life's going to be just like theirs. And he run and hid and was ready to quit after what he'd seen God do. What have you seen God do tonight? How have you seen Him move and you've seen Him work and you've seen Him do things not only in your life but in other people's lives and yet what do we do? We are ready to quit at the first little sign. No, sir. Thank God I'm on the winning side. I've got a generation before me and I've got, if the Lord don't come back, I've got generations behind me. I want to keep on going and pass it to that next generation. So don't ever consider quitting. Jeremiah in chapter 20 said, I'm done. I'll not speak his name again. But he said, the word burned in my bones as a fire and I could not forbear. I can't quit. It don't matter that I've been put in the stocks. It don't matter that I've been put in the prison. It don't matter that they cast me down in a pit in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the pit that's pretty much a second. <laughs> A septic tank. Mm -hmm. He said, This is where I'm at, but I can't quit. I can't quit. He said, I gotta go home because there's a fire in my bones that won't quit. Let me tell you something, boy. That's the thing about us with, with Christ. See, again, chapter 11 says they were all looking for it. For you and me, it's already happened. He's already gone to the cross. He's already come out of the tomb. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. The job is finished and what's left is for Him to come back after us. So we don't, we don't cast the mantle aside. We don't compromise the Word. We don't consider defeat. And you say, but preacher, sometimes, sometimes it just gets so hard. Well, Romans chapter 8. I told you, if I've got a favorite chapter in Scripture, that's it. Because it starts out with no condemnation and ends up with no separation. Mm -hmm. It says, and you've read it the last two Sundays in a row in Sunday school, verse 31, if God be for us, who can be against us? But verse 37 says, we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. Mm -hmm. So don't consider defeat. You ain't lost. If you're a saved child of God, you definitely are already on the winning side. Mm -hmm. So wherefore we are compassed about, not just those in chapter 11, but thank God those that's already gone on before. I remember when I, when I come down here, Brother, Brother Raymond began to talk, and I know some of y'all could remember him too, and, we began to talk, and he'd say, now just where are you from? And I told him. He said, you know Berlin Newman? I said, Berlin Newman was my pastor when I was a little boy. He said, he preached about you. He said, you know Grover Hall? I said, I sure did. Grover Hall and my daddy was deacons together at one point. And I said, I went to school. He said, he's preached about you. He said, did you know Harris Easter? I said, sure did. I said, Harris growed up right up a creek from, and all his brothers and sisters right up a creek from where my daddy did. He said, Harris Easter's preached right here. And I said, well, you know as many people up there as I do. He said, Brother George liked to bring them down here. He said, what's your point? Thank God... Those men I knew growing up. That is your heritage. That 
is who we're taking the baton from and carrying it to pass it on to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And we get to the point that we're discouraged, when we get to the point that we're down, when we get to the point that we think that I can't make it any further, then go to verse 2 and look unto Jesus. The author and finisher of our faith. Thank God who for the joy that was set before Him, despising the shame, endured the cross. Thank God He did everything for us that needed to be wrong. So tonight, wherefore? Because of what's gone before us. I look back and I think about the heritage just of this church. And I think, man, when I look at the men that's been here before me, there ain't no way I can fill in shoes. I can't do. I'm not, I, I, I can't. I'm not worthy to even come in behind men like that. But thank God all I can do is what I feel like God's leading me to do. And so because of them, because of those in chapter 11, we need to keep going. Mm -hmm. Because of those preachers that we've known and have taught us and, and preached to us, we need to keep going. Because of Brother George Farmer, Brother Chet Montgomery, we need to keep going. Amen. We have a heritage. We have a legacy. And wherefore, because of that, we need to keep running the race. Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you for the day you've given us, for the way you've took care of us, for watching over, supplying our needs, and giving us health and strength. We thank you for the opportunity to be back in your house tonight for each one of these that's come out. Thank you we've had this time. And I thank you, Lord, for allowing us to look at a portion of your scripture. And I pray, God, tonight I said what you'd have me to say. Father, I realize tonight when I see those that have gone before me, I realize, God, just how unworthy I am. But God, as the Apostle Paul said, you counted me worthy and put me in the ministry. So God, let me run my race so that I can pass something along to the next generation. I thank you for these that are here tonight. I thank you for the attention that was paid. Thank you for allowing us to come one more time and meet together again. Go with us through the remainder of the service and have your way for we ask it in Jesus' holy name. Amen.